Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pete Chadwick. Um, I'm uh, a member of the product working group um, as uh, we participate in terms of the community to help understand what customer requirements there may be and, and reflect those back into the technical committees to, to drive that. And one of the areas we've been focused on is, is what does OpenStack need to do, if anything, to be more prepared for dealing with enterprise workloads. And so the purpose of this panel today is, is really to, to, to have free people who've been in the trenches working on, on enterprise activities, you know, share their thoughts. Um, but we'd also like to encourage any, any questions and comments from the, uh, uh, from the audience. So real quickly, let me introduce um, uh, the panel. Uh, again, my name is Pete Chadwick. I'm a product manager at SUSE, responsible for our OpenStack distribution, SUSE OpenStack Cloud. Uh, starting to the left, we have uh, uh, Kay Tokunaga um, is the manager of OpenStack and Linux development at Fujitsu. He's been uh, participating in open source uh, environments since 2002, and his team is really focused on, on contributions to Linux and making things more high availability. Um, moving um, to the left, uh, Andrew Batty is a principal architect and developer at SAP. Uh, has 18 years of experience delivering uh, enterprise technology, uh, and he's focused now on um, defining, he's working with a small group of technologists to define the global infrastructure to run SAP's cloud products. And, and last but not least is uh, uh, Prashant Rao, who manages his cloud computing engineering team at Wells Fargo. Um, and they're responsible for the enterprise-wide deployment of, uh, of enterprise uh, cloud workloads. So with that, what I'd like to do, um, I, mean, I talked about the goal is to start off the discussion um, by asking some questions to the panelists. And, and as I said, as we go through this, if there's, I mean, we're blinded up here by these lights, so we can hardly see anything. But if anybody has a, a question they would like to, to answer, uh, of anybody on the on the panel, please feel free to do that. So, so just to start just to start off real quickly, why don't each of you talk a little bit about you know what your experiences have been with OpenStack, especially in the area of, of enterprise uh, computing? Yeah, sure. Um, so, as uh, uh, <laughs> so as, as Pete said, uh, so I work at Wells Fargo, and basically a couple of years ago, we started on an initiative to deploy an enterprise grade private cloud within the company. And Wells Fargo is obviously in the financial services, large bank, in fact, the largest bank in the, in the world by some measures, um, and so a regulated industry. So it's not as if we can have our app dev groups within the company basically use Amazon or Google or, or Microsoft Azure or things like that. So because that data needs to stay within the company, there is a need to basically offer that same set of services for cloud computing to the app dev for, uh, community within the bank, but offer it in you know, a secured environment. So um, we started out a few years ago, about three years ago with uh, Havana, uh, and then we moved forward with Ice House, and we're currently in the process of, of upgrading to Liberty, which is gonna be a significant jump. Um, but we, we initially started with a single data center deployment, and then we branched out to about seven different data centers with different clouds for different types of workloads, and we're kind of continuing that expansion. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at there for now, and we can kind of get into more details later on. Okay, hi. Um, I'm, uh, my experience with OpenStack really started surprisingly probably about 15 years ago when we, <laughs> I was sat in a basement in our headquarters building a, what is now or would be recognized now as a sort of Cinder Nova clone. And if I flash forward 12 years, I'm still doing that. Um, and that was, what, three years ago? And by that time, I think we had something like 20, 25 systems doing exactly the same thing. And somebody um, said, why are we doing this? And why aren't you using OpenStack? And nobody could give us a compelling reason not to. And that started our, I guess, our real journey with OpenStack. And um, we started with a very small to us pilot. It's um, running about 1,500 VMs now, I think, a um, little more. And um, it worked very well. We learned quite a lot. I think we both good and bad. And um, we're now proceeding on a sort of scale out um, mission. We're looking at Kubernetes containers, um, 13 data centers around the world, I think. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to it, I guess. Great. Um, 
So my background is Linux development. So we've been working on to, to make Linux uh, enterprise grade for even mission critical customers. And the Fujitsu provides both a public and a private cloud service uh, that are based on the OpenStack. And so uh, last February, we've announced we will migrate uh, all internal systems to the uh, public cloud platform. So the internal systems consist of uh, more than 600 of, uh, systems across uh, 13,000 servers globally that encompass um, a mixture of uh, legacy and uh, cutting edge servers. And to share our experience in the enterprise, uh, I'll just do, uh, I'd like to just ex explain one example of the problems we've encountered in the past. Um, so in order to obtain more performance on the deployment, uh, we increased the number of threats, workers in the heat. And that caused a uh, max connection errors in HA proxy. So we configured the Linux kernel and HA proxy uh, to, to allow more connections. And, and then that caused, caused the uh, total disaster. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's a several tens of thousands of messages or, were issued from hundreds of compute nodes to the conductor that got stacked in the uh, messaging queue servers and so causing the whole OpenStack system to be out of service. So we increased um, the processing capability of RabbitMQ servers and they waited for like several days, and then the problem uh, was resolved. So the lessons uh, we learned from the experience is even a single small change can cause such a big disaster, and it's really hard to investigate the problem, root cause of the problem, because uh, OpenStack consists of many components, and uh, there are uh, in intricately uh, interrelated, and, and the, some of the components don't even provide enough data for troubleshooting. So I think that's the, one of the things we need to improve in the future. Okay. I mean, that, that leads into uh, uh, to the second question, <laughs> which is, from each of your perspectives, what does the community development team need to be addressing to improve the suitability of OpenStack for enterprise environments? I don't know who wants to start. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start out with a couple of things. So one of the things that we encountered over the last couple of years was uh, Wells Fargo has a lot of requirements for deploying servers. Um, one of the key uh, uh, requirements is, is essentially that every single server uh, needs to be tracked as an asset. And so that means even a virtual machine. And whether that was pre-cloud or within the cloud, that asset as a server needs to be tracked uh, in our enterprise asset management system. And given that cloud instances, right, you can spin up, spin down, you may, you know, in a matter of minutes, um, that requirement is very challenging. So one of the things that my engineering team had to do is essentially build out interfaces that were event trigger based, right, based on you know messages off of Nova or, Os or um, RabbitMQ or Oslo to essentially fire off connections to say, yes, this asset is a real asset. Here's its UUID and, and IP address and other information about it. Pass it off to our asset management system. Well, by the time that interface, and because some of these systems within the bank, for example, are, are, um, are batch-based, by the time it gets processed in the asset management system, it's, it's no longer even alive. So it kind of <laughs> defeats the purpose, for one. But two, I guess with regard, one of the things we had to do was um, we have to track a lot of metadata, or not metadata in the sense of Nova, but attributes about those assets and the tenants, et cetera. And what we found failing or lacking was essentially the extensibility. Uh, whether that be extensions to hook into um, uh, you know, the, the uh, Oslo messaging very easily because it's a little complicated, or even just tracking additional metadata attributes about tenants and, 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 and instances. Um, 
it made it challenging not to have kind of that extensible capability. What that's for, and that was including for asset management as well as for chargeback. Um, I guess in a number of other those areas, we found that, okay, you get a lot of the core capabilities that are great for, you know, let's say a public cloud and spinning up infrastructure, but all of that other stuff to keep track of what you're doing in the cloud, um, you know, from a, a regulated point of view, that was, you know, that continues to be a challenge for us. Um, another one that uh, I think is, um, and I think one of the things, well, I think one of the uh, things I learned in the last couple of days, for example, there's a new project called Mistral, or at least new to me, and, and that seems to have a lot of promise because that does seem to provide some of that workflow capability that I think will, you know, potentially can address some of those needs. Um, so I think the community is getting there, um, and, and some of the product capabilities are evolving to support some of those needs and those hooks into the cloud infrastructure, but I think, you know, that's what we've seen over the last couple of years. Yeah, so as I said uh, earlier, our, one, one of our focuses is, um, is containerizing OpenStack and moving the whole control plane into containers. And I think um, the, the big thing for us at the moment is to, just to be able to move the data plane off those containers and out of software and into um, hardware devices. We're getting a lot of help, I think, from the, the sort of vendor extensions and the vendor community um, in doing that. And it's, uh, it's a requirement, but it's, it's largely fulfilled, I think. It's, um, it's very surprising, I think, how, how ephemeral we can start to treat the OpenStack control plane. We can just spin the whole thing down, and the whole customer workload is, is, uh, is still in place. And I think that, that vendor community is really powerful for us, I think. Um, there's a couple of other, um, I guess, issues that we see and, and things that really, I'm not sure they hurt us, but they cause us a lot of disruption. And one of the things is around um, sort of intercomponent interoperability. So something like Keystone V3, which has been around for, I don't know, six releases, five releases, and still there are things that, that don't work with it. And it causes us, you know, we have to patch, we have to find the problems, we have to change our, our, our approach to things. And it's, we have a similar problem where we're scaling our network with multi-segment um, networks. And it was introduced, I think, uh, two releases ago, and it's still largely unknown and unsupported in a, lot of, in a lot of stuff. And I think that, there are two examples, but there are others, but I think that's quite, um, quite a, a big issue in terms of the amount of time it takes us to adopt stuff. Um, I think the other thing is around, it's not something we've really encountered, and, and maybe some of the other guys can comment on this, but I think we're hearing a lot around upgrade and the way and the release cycle, uh, API stability, and making sure that they really are sort of contracts that are, that are supported. So I think it's all about you know, consistency and, and, and making sure that things work around the, in, the entire sort of components that, um, that's quite important to us. Okay. So, okay, um, I'd like to explain the, what the enterprise means to, to us first. So uh, for us, uh, enterprise basically are the organization that, uh, that needs to run their systems without downtime. So for example, the bankings, uh, government, and the stock exchange, or something like that. And so once such a systems uh, goes down, uh, they will have a significant impact to the society. So um, let me uh, talk about uh, three requirements from enterprise here, um, because those are the ones I'm focusing on right now. And so the first one is uh, predictable and consistent performance. Enterprise systems need to get uh, predictable and consistent performance uh, from compute networking and uh, storage services. And I think bare metals uh, provisioning service uh, should address that issue as because um, users can have a physical server for themselves. Uh, that means uh, you can get away from the noisy neighbors that uh, you may encounter on uh, VMs. And the second one is high availability. Um, so, in case that the hardware failure or power failure in the data center, enterprise systems running there have to continue running on somewhere else. And I think uh, multi-site OpenStack uh, 
uh, should address that. And the third one is uh, serviceability. Uh, I think there is uh, two things for that. Uh, the one thing is an ability to maintain OpenStack system uh, without requiring downtime. So the cloud platform has to be able to uh, apply a fix or even upgrade while the system is running. Now another thing is uh, fast and reliable troubleshooting. Um, so in a case a user encounter a problem, uh, we, the, the, the root cause of the problem needs to be investigated immediately so that the user can apply an um, appropriate fix and that they can continue their business without further uh, concerns. So those are the three things. Okay, I think, I think you, you raised an interesting point, I think, I think Prashant raised it as well, which is um, there seems to be a lot of debate in the community, and I'd, I'd ask for a show of hands, but again, I can't see it, is whether or not pets should be allowed in OpenStack. Um, there's a lot of people that say OpenStack is a, is a, is a cloud platform, um, it should only be cattle, we shouldn't worry about that. Um, but it seems that there is a requirement that you want to move what we would consider traditional enterprise workloads into, the, uh, into OpenStack. Um, comments on that? Is that? I, I think, I'm not going to answer the question directly, but it, it's, a, it's, it's quite related and it goes back to another requirement. And it's, um, it's interesting you say that because we have a real issue it, it, when we try to put um, OpenStack into containers that we have to start running OpenStack as a pet. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, it, it's re, I mean, and it's, from my perspective, applications should be able to just start up and it doesn't matter whether the database isn't there, they, they, they should just work. And I think, I think um, my answer would be yes and no because there's always going to be a, a legacy sort of mm -hmm. application that you can't change. But I think, um, I, I think it's as a requirement for OpenStack, it would be great if we could just start up Nova Conductor without RabbitMQ and it not hang. That, that's, that, you mean, which is, which is a real sort of pet condition that we have to mm -hmm. sort of deal with. And I think, um, yeah, I think it doesn't answer the question, but I think, I think those, those pets should be as eradicated if we can. And I think OpenStack <laughs> could start by, um, by doing some of that itself, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I think it's a little bit far-fetched and perhaps even naive to think that uh, we're going to get rid of pets, right? I mean, and, and I think, you know, at least from my vantage point within, you know, a company like Wells Fargo, um, in order to justify that, that spend and, and the project itself, there's got to be this, you know, there's got to be some savings associated with it, right? Or some, you know, increased ability and capabilities. And, you know, the way we've done it, of course, is said that, We've continued to use exist our existing hypervisor, um, you know, which is very uh, pet friendly, and, and therefore, really, OpenStack becomes a control plane that we could um, migrate both pet friendly apps as well as you know applications that are rewritten and developed for the cloud. Um, because given the size of my company, um, there's thousands upon thousands of applications, and they're not going to be rewritten overnight. Now, there may be only about 10% of those may be uh, like the big, big rock applications that really are, will move the needle and the rest are kind of your small, you know, .NET applications or Tomcat based web apps and things like that, like really small ones. Like those, yeah, those are, there makes no sense to rewrite those into a cloud native format. So I think with that said, I mean, I think they're in many companies and in, in, uh, in enterprises, there's just too many applications that if the barrier to entry is that your cloud requires you to have a only cloud native apps, that's a impediment to getting adoption. So really, you need to have that, uh, um, you know, that offering that's going to allow for you know, really these legacy applications to onboard safely and, you know, to meet their needs, right? They're not going to be, they're not going to fail safe at the uh, um, application layer. I mean, they're going to rely upon that underlying hardware and that infrastructure to fail. So that's at least my vantage point, in my view. Okay. Yeah, sorry, can I add 
just follow up on, on that, and I think, I think we've maybe got some more questions around the, the topic, but I, I also agree, I think, despite what I said around, um, around the, the sort of pets in containers, I think, I think realistically it is unreasonable to say you're not gonna, um, you're not gonna have applications that need some care. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think, you know, we'll maybe talk about it later, but there is definitely a, a sort of, even not in the cloud, but integrating with cloud applications is something that's gonna happen, I think, for the foreseeable future from our perspective, I think. Okay, as, uh, and Andrew, just as a follow-up to that, um, you know, a, a lot of the application workloads that enterprise uses come from ISVs, and one of the challenges we've seen in the product working group is trying to get ISVs to get more um, active in saying, yes, we're gonna bring our applications, we're gonna you know, put them on an open stack whether they have to be rewritten or not. Um, you know, from an SAP perspective, to the extent that you can, what do you think um, is needed to get ISVs to be more active in, in supporting OpenStack? Well, I think, I mean, we, we sort of have two hats on in that we are to some degree an ISV as well, right. as, a, as, well as a platform. And yep. I think, um, I think the, it, it really is um, unrealistic to expect that every application in it from every vendor is going is going to be able to be put into a cloud and we we're all, you know we see um, some of our customers pushing back to say you know we don't want to run your software in the cloud we want to mm -hmm. run it in premise and and they've got very valid reasons for doing so and um, I, I think the the um, you know the, the there's a, a move to say you know the periphery applications can start to, to push out there the, the non mission critical or the less mission critical applications can can start to go out there but I think uh, I think, you know, the, the bigger issue I think for ISVs is more the move from from a, a software vendor that's shipping CDs or binary downloads to uh -huh. service providers. I think that's a really big challenge in terms of moving their applications from from something they just ship and support remotely to actually owning the service and actually keeping the uptime and and doing all of that. And I think anything that can make it easier for people to do that would, would really help. Okay. And I think from our perspective, that's also true. So the easier it is for us to deliver a, a fully scalable cloud that's, that's got 99.xxxx percent right. uptime, that's gonna make it less risky for us to sort of push out those more mission critical applications out there, I think. But the risk of starting a debate, I think Prashanth just said, there's certain things that you do that you're never going to do in a public cloud. So, you know, how do you, how do you talk to your ISV, you know, partners to say, here's what, here's where we're going, and and what what should, you know, this is this is our new target. How but I, I, I think for that, that, one of the solutions that we're seeing for that is 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 this sort of on-premise, on-demand solution where you can actually link the two through services okay. like the VPN as a service, where you you're not forcing people into a particular scenario, you're looking very much at a hybrid application, I think. It's, okay. um, I think that's a very valid scenario for mm -hmm. a lot of our customers. So, anything, Dave? Um, no, not really. I mean, just because, I mean, hybrid cloud and regulated industries is probably many years away. Um, so, I, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, m most of our application delivery for, you know, from an ISV point of view is still going to be that traditional method of, mm -hmm. you know, either baking it into the image or as part of a post-provisioning process, deploying that software. Um, okay. so. Are there things that the ISVs could do to make that easier in an OpenStack environment? Yeah, that's interesting. I guess, you know, with, uh, yeah, I, I guess we're, we haven't seen it yet, but, you know, pre cam pre-canned images from ISVs delivered, you know, as images that we could then import into Glance, uh, you know, and just like fire up, let's say, a, you know, an app server and things like that. I mean, a lot of that stuff you can just build, you know, um, um, you know, you can build on your own. Our biggest challenge is around patching. Uh, okay. So we've got a lot of challenges around, um, get, you know, just there's different support groups in an organization like, like the bank, uh, it's not just the, the core cloud group which maintains those assets. Once those assets or those servers are spun up, then it's a whole host of other operational support groups that kind of take control. So it's, and, and this raises kind of a side question or a topic I was going to bring up later on, but I'll just bring it up now, is just around the organizational skill set that's required to support a cloud. Um, and what we found and is that, like, I obviously have network leads and, and uh, compute leads and storage leads, but overwhelmingly, and like one of the lessons learned for the past three years that I've seen is that um, that skill set is, is hard to come by in many enterprises. And so 
I think that's actually one of the challenges to the community as to like, how do you get, um, how do you kind of foster more knowledge around like this hybrid new set of skills that's required? I mean, there's, I know there's a lot of initiatives taking place, but it's very, very challenging to present, uh, you know, a product offering like OpenStack and then expect everyone just to go off and learn it. And, and so that, you know, everyone's probably aware of it who's run, running a cloud or even tried to hire for it. It's not a easy skill set to come by. So I think, and that kind of touches upon, um, you know, just the operational aspects of, okay, you have a cloud and you've stood it up. Now, how do you maintain it? How do you essentially build that expertise? And, you know, I think there are things that the community could do to help address some of that. I'm not sure what all of that is aside from mentoring and learning, but there's, there's probably things at a product level that could be done to make things easier where you don't have to be an expert in every single one of these technologies. So. Okay. So let me, let me pause for a second and just, is there anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question from the panelists? We have microphones here and here. Please. Hi, Scott Estee with Dell Services. Uh, like the discussion, thanks guys. I'd like to hear more about um, when I walk in and uh, have sort of my thumb on the pulse of a lot of Fortune 100 companies. It's so talking about what you're discussing, operationalizing um, um, OpenStack. But uh, I think it's sort of the, the common denominator is, question is how do you abstract the complexities of the technology in such that uh, users can consume or use a cloud and how and B, uh, how does that work in enterprises? It works in enterprises by matching three things, right? Making it highly available, easy to use, easy to recover from. Um, and um, easy to consume, I guess. And I just wanted to see what your, your thoughts and comments on that were. Um, yeah, sure, I'll go first. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we rely, uh, you know, at least within the bank, I mean, as I mentioned, we, we've, we use a hypervisor that is, you know, provides all those capabilities, right? That high availability, that rely, um, um, you know, and, and, the, and uh, I guess ease of integration. So that, that addresses some of that. One of the questions you asked was about like the ease of use, and in what's interesting, um, as contrast to like public cloud, let's say with Amazon or Google or so on, right? Whereas typically app devs themselves, like you know, blogging in and basically provisioning the infrastructure they want. Well, in in the bank, we, for example, the app dev groups don't do that. There's actually a separate team. There's a whole build and release team, and and essentially that group is essentially the. Um, the broker or mediator between the app dev groups and the infrastructure teams or between the cloud teams, namely us. So that build and release team, for example, they're already kind of, they've got that skill set and they're the ones responsible for translating app dev requirements into uh, infrastructure requirements. So in, in the previous talk that was just in this room, they were talking about the, the tenant and basically the needs of the tenant. And it got me thinking that, you know, the tenant by and large in the enterprise isn't necessarily your app dev community. They're the consumers of that infrastructure. They're the users of that infrastructure, but they're not the provisioners of that infrastructure. And especially now when, when we look at, um, like we're just starting to introduce Neutron. And Neutron, obviously networking, that's a really scary thing from a self-service point of view. So we really don't, I mean, an app dev, folks by and large don't know much about networking. Like they really don't care about it. But you have this other kind of persona, which is like the build and release engineer or group. They're the ones who are gonna utilize and kind of make that translation. So I'm not necessarily sure if you should have, if the cloud, how usable it needs to be from an app dev point of view, it needs to be usable to certain experts along those lines, right? Yeah, I think I can echo quite a lot of a lot of those um, those thoughts. I think one thing uh, we do, which we we do want to make a sort of self-service um, nice experience for for everyone who's using at least the internal part of our of our cloud. We we sort of split between our, our customer payload and our sort of internal needs in, from from our developers, and we um, we've accepted. I think that we're going to have to build a essentially a horizon replacement. To, to handle a lot of that sort of onboarding management of projects, the, the network scenarios. There's quite a lot of, of, of stuff which people don't want to care about. They just want a VM in a, in a particular network zone. And I think Horizon doesn't do a great job at, at doing that for a, an end user. It's great for admins and for visualizing what's going on below the or above the, the uh, APIs. But the, 
that onboarding process is something that we, we, you know, we, we couldn't give Horizon, I think, to our end users, and we're going to develop, or we are developing a, a sort of an alternative, um, which includes a lot of those processes, I think. Well, so Dave already covered, you know, pretty much <laughs> the topics. Well, so I'd like to talk about the very specific one. Um, so many things are automated uh, in OpenStack, but the deployment complexity uh, is the one of the uh, great blockers for enterprise. So that's the reason why uh, there are, you know, many v vendors who developed their own deployment tools. And I think it's ideal to have one standard uh, deployment tool for OpenStack so that the, um, you know, enterprise users uh, don't have to learn, you know, many pro procedures depending on the type of so the uh, deployment tools. Okay. Yeah, so I have a quick question for Andrew. So uh, for your container orchestration and, and deployment, are you using uh, upstream project, projects like Cola or Magnum, or are you using your, your own? Um... Um, we're using, at the moment, we're using the Cola container build. So we're, we're not using the, the, the orchestration elements of, of Cola. We're using the, the, the Cola to build the, the, the base containers. And we found, I think we, we, we've discussed a little bit with the, the Color PTL around the rationale behind some of the, the uh, constructs in Color. And I think what, what we've done is we're running on Kubernetes, and that handles a lot of mm. the, 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 the things that were missing, I think, in the initial um, right. or when Color started. And uh, we found that, you know, despite what I was saying about the, the pets and, the, and, the, and the, the issues that we see there, I think we found that, that there's... There's some really nice capabilities um, in the container world, and particularly in Kubernetes, that allows us to, to basically fire everything out there using liveness probes and checks that things are you know, doing what they should be doing, and that we, we can reach a sort of a state of eventual stability. It takes maybe two or three minutes, maybe five, for the whole thing to, to, to settle down, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's working quite well. So the, the, the orchestration part of Collar is, is a little heavyweight for us, I think, in the, in the approach we've taken at least. So, so, so that being said, uh, as this container ecosystem matures, other than multi-tenancy, do you see any need in future to run it on OpenStack? Or just run it bare metal containerized? Workloads? Well, we, yeah, we, we, we run Kubernetes on bare metal, and then we run OpenStack on top of it, and I think, you know, we're, we're gonna, we're seeing already a big demand in our organization, not necessarily from, from, um, from our customers for, for containers and, and a container as a service right. type thing is gonna, is gonna come, I hope. But I think right now, we're, you know, we're, we need to be able to provision virtual machines, bare metal, and OpenStack is gonna do that on top of uh, okay. Kubernetes, I hope. Good. Hi, this is Sanjay. Um, uh, can you share your experience and your wish list for operationalizing security in these environments? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest, it's not something. It's not something within my sort of um, sphere of, um, of of expertise. We have a we have a large security team who who when we're when we're um, when we've provisioned a a platform come along and say, um, you know, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And I think we've found that, uh, certainly based on our, our previous um, sort of iterations, that OpenStack really helps us to do that. And there's, there's a lot less um, of, of that sort of requirement of just adopting the base, um, the base OpenStack stuff. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, detail that they, they go into, which unfortunately I I, I couldn't really comment on, but I think we, we're seeing a massive improvement, I think, in our ability to provide a, a secure base platform already um, over the, some of the stuff that we were developing ourselves. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess one of the, one of my top items has been just the, um, the RBAC model within OpenStack, and, and right now using the policy.json file in each, uh, in each project and not having a way to uh, manage that aside from just editing that file. Like, like, I mean, I think the RBAC uh, issue, I'm just surprised it's taken this long. Like, th that would be, like, my number one um, wish list item. You know? Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's just one. The other one was um, 
uh, I know recently, like, for example, in a large company like, you know, the bank, you know, there's uh, uh, Active Directory is, you know, uh, kind of, that's how we manage users, obviously. Um, so for recently, we were essentially using Active Directory for both uh, authorization, uh, association, and authentication. And I think there's some changes there that are taking place. So I think there's some improvements happening. Uh, and I think, you know, there's going to be the, um, a move towards, I think, using um, MySQL for, um, uh, I think, association and authorization, and then uh, LDAP for or Active Directory for uh, authentication. So I think there are some things that are happening there that are probably uh, beneficial. Um, but I think it's still evolving. I mean, I attended some a talk yesterday on Keystone, um, and I think there's, it's evolving, but I think, like, the policy.json was the one that's like, you know, I know it's been, it, there's a lot of work going on, but that's like the one, one thing that I'd love to see, you know, continue to evolve. The other one is around key management. Uh, I, I haven't followed Barbicon too closely, but I know that that's uh, um, another project that has a lot of promise, and that would be something that, you know, is interesting as well for all the services that are used by OpenStack. So as we're, as we're moving our pets to cattle, do you find that the total number of OSIs under management within the firms is doubling, tripling, quadrupling now that it's easier for end users to spin up their own VMs, or do you find that you're pretty solid on number of total OSIs and it's really just a shift as time goes on from corporate IT managed over to sort of self-managed? I don't know if it's if it's increasing, but it's um, I think, and I, and I can really only speak for our previous platform, which was which was um, um, more about the or the OpenStack platforms that we're putting in place now are much more about our customers. The the previous platform was about enabling our developers, and I think we found that we, we put the system out there, and people would just come, and and it grew and it grew and it grew, and we went from nothing to 20,000 plus VMs growing at, I don't know, three or 400 a day for within, within sort of two or three years. And I think, uh, yeah, it, it, we, we put things in place to, to, um, to um, try and throttle that or to encourage sort of exploration. We were at a, a, a nice presentation earlier about some, some uh, stuff coming into OpenStack to do that. But I think if you put it there, people will come, I think is our experience, at least in our internal, um, internal environment. So I think we're about, um, one thing I wanted to do was, was, Kay, if you could just talk a little bit about the product working group, because one of the things that the product working group, as I mentioned, was trying to get, to get feedback. So, you know, Kay, if you want to talk a little bit more about that and sure. what we do. So pr product working group uh, was started about two years ago, uh, coming out of the uh, Paris summit. And product working group is to increase the voice of the markets, operators, and the users into a um, development process of OpenStack. And so, so we, so basically the basic flow is we create users, user story that include um, problem descriptions and um, use cases and the usage scenarios, I guess. And so we also use the Garrett process uh, to, to manage user stories and also get comments uh, to have other people to contribute them. So if we agree that a user story is complete enough, uh, we translate it into a, uh, a cross-project spec blueprint RFE or spec appropriately. And so, um, so that's the first time to expose our stories to the community so we can get more attention from the community or developers. And so that's pretty much the workflow of the right. product and working group. You know, one of the key points is anyone's welcome to contribute um, on commenting on user stories at all. It is done in the open. And if people want to submit them, we'd be more than happy to, um, to take a look at that. So I think with that, we're out of time. Um, so I thank everyone uh, for joining us. I especially want to thank Prashant, Andrew, and um, NK for spending some time here with us. So thank you, and hope you have a great rest of the summit.